So you want to be a tailwheel pilot. That's exactly what we're talking about in today's Private Pilot Podcast. What is happening, M0 Nation? Jason Shepard, how are you all doing? Where are my future tailwheel pilots at? Let me know in the comments below or with a review on uh, Audible or iTunes, however you listen to your podcast. You are listening to the Private Pod Podcast, which today is all about tailwheel flying. Brought to you by our number one rated online ground school, m0a.com, m0atrial.com if you want to take a two-week trial of it. Where are my ground school members at that are watching this? I'm waving back at you all as well. So you all know we're in a series, well maybe you know, we're in a series now called Expanding Your Horizons and it's all about, I've got my private pilot certificate, now what? Like, now what am I going to do with this private pilot certificate? Well, Jamie Beckett is doing a fantastic job. That's world famous Jamie Beckett, by the way. World famous Jamie Beckett is doing a fantastic job leading um, this series and I'm so thankful for it. You know how much content we produce between um, two webinars uh, for our online ground school members every single week, an in-flight coffee, in addition to a YouTube video, a Facebook video, Instagram reels, like there's so many videos, we produce so much content in a week, it is nice to let have Jamie produce uh, some content for us, allows me to get uh, not only some rest, but get back to get the creative juices flowing as well as I work on our uh, April series, which I think will be a big home run and save some lives. But we're here today to talk about tailwheel flying. So tailwheel pilots, uh, I'd love first off to hear your tailwheel stories or your tailwheel aspirations in the comments below if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook. But I want to share with you a little bit about my tailwheel story as well. You know, my tailwheel story, I have to go back, geez, in my logbook to see when I actually earned my tailwheel. It was over a decade ago for sure. Um, I earned my tailwheel in a Piper Vagabond, not a very popular airplane. Uh, if you know the, if you study aviation history and business aviation history, the Vagabond is known as the plane that saved Piper. Piper was going through a period of near bankruptcy, um, bringing in investors. Uh, Piper was actually publicly traded for a short period, not a short period, quite a few years. Um, and they were coming out of the war and obviously wartime producing airplanes. The Cubs were used, and I'm sorry to turn this into a, a history lesson. I love, I love business, I love business history, um, aviation business history especially. They were coming out of the war times, um, Piper J3 Cubs at the time, which are front to back, that's what I own, a 1940 J3 Cub, were somewhat used as World War II trainers, um, but they were more so used uh, as what we call grasshopper pilots. Fun fact, Piper Cubs did participate uh, in World War II. Uh, they were used as grasshoppers. What is a grasshopper? Well, that is the nickname the general gave them because <laughs> they they didn't uh, they didn't carry any weaponry or anything like that. In fact, their only weapons were when they flew a general and he had his pistol with him. That was the weapon that the Piper Cub carried with them. But what the Piper Cub would do um, is they would fly reconnaissance missions to say, hey, you're getting outflanked on the left. So they, they'd overfly the ground troops and then radio down, hey, they're flanking you on the left. Watch, you know, or let's work up this hill this way. There's a valley down here. That's a better strategic point. This is before we had drones and satellites and everything else. So the grasshopper, that was their squadron title. The grasshoppers uh, served, and they flew other aircraft too, right? They, they flew um, uh, champs and other things, but the Cub was the primary grasshopper trainer. So fun, uh, fun fact for the day. So coming with the end of World War II, Piper was really, really in a tough spot, as you can imagine, really ramped up production, everything else, making a lot of airplanes, had to lay a lot of people off because the demand just wasn't there anymore. Facing bankruptcy, uh, they actually brought in a, uh, a short-term CEO who specialized in turnarounds, and he had the idea of, listen, we already we need to work with what we have. We're going to make this Piper Vagabond, and the goal of the Vagabond was not only to save Piper, but to make it on the cheap. That's why you'll only find them in the same Piper yellow paint because that's all the paint they had left over. If you look up Piper Vagabonds, if you're watching this, um, Coach Ray, maybe uh, you could grab a picture of a classic Piper Vagabond. You'll notice 
traditional Piper Vagabonds do not have a lightning stripe. You know how the Cub, like my Cub has that black lightning bolt going down it? That was classic Piper. Do you know, uh, back then it cost around 15 cents to put that lightning bolt on the plane. The temporary CEO, and his name escapes me, said, no, we're doing this on the cheap, no lightning bolt. Everyone's like, what do you mean no lightning bolt? Everyone knows Piper by its lightning bolt. He goes, no, I'm saving 15 cents per airplane. That's, that's how tight it was at Piper at one point. Um, to save, and 15 cents was a lot back in the, back in the 40s. It was, it was a different amount back in the 40s and 50s. Um, no lightning bolt on the Piper Vagabond. So the Piper Vagabond is a side-by-side -side aircraft, and it was, um, a lot of people were worried about flying front to back, uh, like we traditionally, that, that tandem style that we think about. So they put them side by side, which is fun. It's great, you're, you're next to your instructor. However, what they didn't realize is this really shortened up the arm, the length, how long the airplane is. And in a tailwheel airplane, the distance from the mains to the tailwheel is a big deal. You look at something like a DC-3, from the mains to the tail, it's just this big long arm. It takes a lot of yawing, a lot of that lateral movement to ground loop, which is where you bring that tail around and literally loop the plane and 180 usually cause them the wing to hit the ground as well. We'll talk about tailwheel accidents here in a second. Um, when you short, and flying my 1940 Cub, it can be squirrely, but man, you shorten that up even more by having two seats side by side, the Vagabond is a squirrely, squirrely airplane to fly. And that is one of the reasons, while yes, it certainly saved Piper, it, um, it um, didn't end up being the big mass success like they were, um, they were hoping for to continue on, like something like the Piper Cub is today. I mean, there's, there's companies, Legend Cub, Carbon Cub, I mean, how many top, you know, top Cub, there's how many people that are still taking the public domain plans and still making modern Piper Cubs. I mean, it's just such a classic, classic airplane. Front to back seating, as you know it, like my 1940 original uh, J3 Cub is. You know, and tailwheel flying for me is, it's not only an art, it's true stick and rudder skills. And if I can be vulnerable with you, it's an area of my flying I haven't mastered. Um, and I don't know if I ever will master it. Tailwheel flying is, is very, very challenging. In fact, I... People, a lot of my friends make fun of me uh, with the Piper Cub because I hardly fly the thing. Um, I actually contemplated selling it a few times just because I'm hardly flying the thing because I am so, I'm an extreme fair weather flyer when it comes to the Piper Cub. What do I mean by that? Uh, I only fly it off the grass. It, tail wheels on pavement are a little challenging. Um, if the winds, one time I got caught in a seven knot crosswind in it and really scared myself good. Um, and, and since then I've just said, you know what I am, and no accidents, just, just one of those moments where you're like thankful to be down on the ground. Um, I remember, and I'll just, I'll, I'll share the story. I shared this um, with, uh, with Jamie Beck. I think I shared on the ground school member webinar. Um, it was like a seven, I was out just practicing, the wind picked up more than I thought, wind sock was showing about seven knots, ATIS was confirming that, crosswind, uh, and a seven knot crosswind, I mean, no big deal in two, three Mike Zulu, but man, in a tailwheel, there's just something different about it. So I remember uh, coming around and the, the handheld radio, because it has, has no electrical system, had fallen and it's just a stick. And I promise I'll get to tailwheel flying here in just a second, I just, sometimes I like sharing stories. Um, my handheld radio fell in the right where the stick meets the meets the the floor, and I didn't hear it. It's a very loud airplane, nor did I feel it. And I remember going to I was turning final, and I, and in a Cub, it's not like a two, it's not like something like Zulu where you can let go of the airplane, and if it's in a turn, it'll kind of just come out of that turn. In the Cub, you literally fly it into the turn, and you fly it out of the turn. You, you do, if you fly it into the turn and let it go, it's gonna stay in that turn. It will never come out of that turn. It's, you have to physically pull it out of the turn. So there I am turning final, and I'm getting pushed because I'm on that crosswind, and I go to pull the stick out of the turn, and the stick is literally stuck. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And my mind instantly went to, the wind is too strong. I can't even overpower the wind because that's like where my twisted, weird mind went. And I said, okay, troubleshoot this. I looked down, I saw the handheld radio, and I took the handheld radio and I just, Threw it like get, get out of here. I <laughs> threw it on the front seat. I uh, want well, nothing to do with you. Um, and came out of that 
had a dicey little crosswind landing with the cortisol and the heart rate up and everything else. And I said, oh, I'm going to slow down. So I'm a three or four knot wind down the runway flyer now in the Piper Cub. It's, it, it's, a, it's a fair weather airplane. Sunset, sunrise. It's also a 65 horsepower original engine. And at 200 pounds, it's basically me flying it by myself, which isn't always the most fun either. So, um, so that there's that aspect uh, of it as well. But um, tailwheel flying is something you have to always work towards and always master. In fact, it's been so many months because the Cub was down with a, with a bad third cylinder. It's been so many months, I would probably go back up with an instructor uh, to get working towards my tailwheel, just currency, let alone proficiency again. And I'm sharing with you all these things. Thing is tailwheel flying dangerous? And no, tailwheel flying is not dangerous. Let me actually share some stats with you. So in the, this is the 31st, Joseph T. Nall report that I'm going to read to you uh, real quick here. So there were um, three, so there were 710, 710 single engine fixed gear accidents in 2019, 710 of them. 307 of those were in tailwheel aircraft. So a little, well, about a third almost, right? We're in tailwheel aircraft. You go, wow, okay, that's, that's interesting. But what makes up the majority of these tailwheel accidents? Well, if I, I'll come on down here I'll, again, I'll read this to you. If I look, um, the majority of these accidents, of those 710 accidents total, 251 were on landing. So there were 251 single engine fixed gear landing accidents. You ready for this? 133 of them, or a little more than half of them, were in tailwheel aircraft. If you look at the landing accident data from 2019, over half of the landing accidents were in tailwheel aircraft. By the way, it has a 1% or 2% fatality rate. I mean, landing accidents are off-runway excursions, too much of a crosswind, ground looping, as I've been sharing about, and ground looping is nothing more than the tail coming around in front of the nose. And if you've flown a tailwheel aircraft, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It sounds silly, but if you sideload that airplane or catch a break or anything like that too much, that tail will whip around and you will do an abrupt 180 or more, 180 degree turn right there on that runway. Typically, you also pick up a wing when you do that and end up striking a wing. Um, Matt and I witnessed a ground loop on takeoff of all things. Typically, um, a ground loop occurs on landing. I want to say um, Mike Patey, who's like super pilot, uh, had a, again, happens to the best of them, had a ground loop on takeoff. There was also like a 20 something knot wind um, um, that related to that. But um, Matt and I witnessed that. So it, was in a, um, it was in a beach stagger wing, which is just a really cool airplane. Sad to see something like that happen. And the gentleman had just bought in it. Uh, see, sad to see something like that happen to a, um, a stagger wing, just such a classic, classic airplane. But yes, tailwheel related accidents. Tailwheel flying is in itself inherently safe. If you are current, if you are proficient, if you are pursuing mastery in everything that we do. Now, learning to fly tailwheels, as Jamie shared in Tuesday's video, is just an endorsable activity as we call it, an endorsable activity. There is no actual hour requirement. You could go up and fly and the instructor could say you're good. I find most instructors like to see three to five hours. And if I can be honest with you, three to five hours is not enough. Like three to five hours of flying tailwheel. Any tailwheel endorsements I've given have been in the five to seven hour type range. And a lot of that is just beating up the traffic pattern. We just continue to beat up the traffic pattern. And that's what it really comes down to. Tailwheel flying is very challenging. Even taxiing, and Jamie shared this in the video, even taxiing a tailwheel aircraft uh, can prove very, very challenging as well. Um, you're sitting so far back. In fact, at the Naples airport, I don't know if, it'll probably make the NTSB reports if it hasn't already. I don't know what the tailwheel aircraft was, but taxiing to the run-up area uh, and didn't see a Mooney that was also in the run-up area. And you kind of do these S-turns out there and the tailwheel, again, I can't recall what kind of tailwheel aircraft it was, basically taxied right on into the wing of the Mooney and just ate up the wing of the Mooney, I'm sure totaled the tailwheel and probably pretty close to totaled the Mooney as well. 
these sort of things just happen. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's a ground-related accident. There could be some distracted taxiing in there, filling with an iPad. There could be a lot of things. The, um, the NTSB, the FAA will determine um, all of that. But tailwheels, despite everything I've shared with you, are inherently safe. It's how we begin to learn to fly. All our classic, I mean, you, you run into, we'll call them some pilots from the olden days, right? I'm almost one of those now. We'll tell you a lot about their, their time flying tail draggers, flying tailwheel aircraft. So I wanted to use this private pilot podcast to really expand on what Jamie was able to share. So this, this complements what Jamie did. So if you haven't watched Tuesday's video, the series is called Expanding Your Horizons. The video on YouTube and Facebook is called Learning to Fly Tailwheels or Learn to Fly Tailwheel Aircraft, something along those lines. We will link to it in the video descriptions uh, below as well as so you can check that out. Hey, do make sure you subscribe here on YouTube or Facebook so you get all our alerts. Subscribe to this podcast, uh, follow it on Audible, subscribe to it on iTunes, however you listen to this podcast. Have a blessed, outstanding, amazing rest of your day. And most importantly, remember, the good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see you.